Dr. Faber, thank you very much for spending some time with us today. It's my pleasure. Thank you. Tell you what, let's just dive right into the questions. We've been collecting questions from Sprott Money customers for the last couple of weeks, and they've got a nice wide range for you. Uh, let's start right in your wheelhouse, I suppose. It has to do with central bank monetary policy. You know, we've been uh, the central banks have been able to manipulate asset prices higher since 2009 through quantitative easing and interest rates. Uh, what's going to stop them from keeping this process going almost indefinitely? Well, this is a very good question because uh, if they were able to increase their balance sheets by 20 times since 1998 up to now, uh, who is to say that they won't increase it another 20 times? So, in principle, uh, a central bank can print money and they can uh, control the flow of credit to some extent, not 100%, but to some extent. And so, in principle, they could keep on buying assets. They can buy the whole government bond market, uh, they can buy mortgage-backed securities, and I suppose uh, that they also intervene in equities, as some foreign central banks have already done. Uh, whether the Fed does it on a regular basis or occasionally, who knows? But I wouldn't be surprised if they also manipulated equity prices, and so we don't know how far they will go. As you know, in some countries, the central banks have instituted negative interest rates, which are an anomaly, uh, historically seen, say, in the 5,000 years of recorded human history. We never had negative interest rates, so this is a, a novelty. It's basically a hidden expropriation uh, that is, in my view, very unfair, and in my view, it will not help the economy much. But the central banks are basically so deep into trouble that they will continue with their policies of printing money. And uh, in the U.S., uh, the Fed, as you know, they slashed the Fed fund rate to next to zero in December 2008, and they had many opportunities to increase interest rates when the economy was actually expanding, 2010, 2011, but they didn't. But precisely as the global economy was weakening, in December 2015, they increased the Fed fund rate marginally, not significantly. But from what I hear them saying at the present time, it is most unlikely, and I repeat, most unlikely that they will continue to increase interest rates. And so the question, to answer the question is we don't know. Uh, the future is unknown to us, but it is especially unknown to us if there are massive market manipulations. But they can ve go very far. And we had countries where they printed money, where stocks kept on going up and up and up, but the currencies weakened. Now, in the case of today's world, we have essentially a few major currencies, the U.S. dollar, the euro, the yen, uh, the pound sterling, and the yuan. And if they all print money at the same time or... Uh, for six months, this bank prints money, and then for the next six months, that central bank prints money. As well. uh, the currencies may all depreciate, in which case I suppose that these currency depreciations will occur against assets, including obviously precious metal. I'm always telling people, if you have this kind of policy in place, and many individuals, they have most of their money in cash, to hold cash under these conditions of money printing is actually very dangerous. Can you expand on that, the, the dangerous quality of owning cash? Well, there certainly well, are. basically, cash, you have no interest on cash, and uh, it depreciates against uh, assets. 
not all assets, because uh, when you print money, not everything goes up at the same rate. So maybe for a few years you have a housing boom, and then for a few years you have a stock market boom, and for a few years you have mm -hmm. fresh metals boom, and for a few years people stuck, stuck their money in art and in collectibles, in Ferraris, and so forth and so on. You never know exactly where the money will flow. But uh, to hold cash in this environment, uh, historically seen, has been dangerous. Uh, we received several questions regarding the supply and demand of physical precious metal. Uh, one has to do with gold. There are a lot of anecdotal stories out there uh, about gold and uh, mining com or I'm sorry, refiners that are running 24/7 shifts trying to keep up with demand. Several readers just wanted to know if you had any stories or any details that you could provide in that regard. I understand the investors' concern with demand and supply, but I'd just like to make one point very clear. In the case of wheat, corn, soybeans, coffee, cocoa, demand and supply is very important because essentially these are perishable commodities and every year the supply is essentially taken up and so whether the demand is strong and usually these commodities they fluctuate according to supplies if there is a bad crop uh, then prices tend to go up because the demand is relatively steady but rising in the long run in the case of gold silver uh, and probably to a lesser extent in the case of platinum, there is huge inventories of gold uh, in the hands of investors. So let's say we have in the world, I don't know, 150,000 tons of gold, of existing uh, gold supplies, of existing gold, and the supply is, uh, I think, 2,000 tons a year or something like this. And so whether the, the, the supply is large or small, in comparison to the existing gold holdings, it's not meaningful. So the demand-supply equation in the case of silver and gold, I suppose in the very long run it has an impact, but not on a yearly basis. What impacts the gold price and the silver price, platinum, to some extent also palladium, is what investors want to do. Are they accumulating or are they selling? Plus, some of these metals may be manipulated. Who knows? Let me lead you then from there to the uh, folks that dig the stuff out of the ground. There has been a significant rally over the last 90 days in the, in the mining shares. So we received several thoughts uh, or questions wondering about your thoughts on that sector going forward. Well, as you know, the mining sector has been a disaster compared to the S&P since 2011. And starting uh, the fourth quarter of last year, the shares began to bottom out and started to appreciate not just against the S&P, but also on their own. In other words, say you look at the various gold ETFs, uh, they're up between 50 and 60 and close to 70 percent from the lows. So they have begun to outperform the S&P. I think they are overbought in the near term. But when I look at the whole investment community in the world, and I travel extensively to Japan and to Europe and the Middle East and everywhere, uh, hardly anybody really owns gold and precious metal share. So my sense is that once the investment community, that is by and large not very smart, <laughs> the mm -hmm. professional money managers, but once these professional money managers understand that the money printing is likely to continue, I don't see it uh, stopping 
I don't believe there is a currency war. I believe the central banks coordinate their monetary policies. And we know that Yellen talks regularly to Draghi and so forth. And in this environment, I think eventually even uh, the fund managers <laughs> will realize that it may be a good idea to keep maybe 5 to 10% of their assets in precious metals. And by then, obviously, precious metals will be on fire as well as the shares of the underlying companies that produce precious metals. My sense is that we've seen a low in precious metals prices. We had a very powerful rally. Uh, very few people actually believe in the rally. Uh, there is probably a correction uh, occurring now or about to happen. And then we'll go, in my view, significantly higher. Sounds good to me. And I think most, of, most folks listening would take you up on that. Yes, I think most people at Sprott, they would love to see significantly higher uh, come out, uh, precious metal prices. Yes. So I'm not saying this because I'm a board member of Sprott. I'm saying this because, for me, the difficulty is to understand that in this money printing environment, precious metals are not yet significantly higher. This is something I don't quite understand. Because let's say, if you look at all the wealth in the world, all the sovereign funds, all the pension funds and so forth, very few own any precious metals. But in my view, they should. Exactly. And we're waiting for that to happen. Perhaps negative interest rates will help drive that too. Uh, that's a very good segue, actually, to a, another string of questions that we received, and it has to do with pension plans and the retirees that are either living off of pension income or expecting to when so many pension plans are either underfunded or they're chasing returns by investing in risky assets. Uh, <laughs> how do you think future monthly pension income will be affected when so few pension funds actually own uh, good hedges and, and investments like precious metals? Well, it's a good question, but you and I and nobody knows where the precious metals really will be the best performing asset. In theory, uh, in a money printing environment, stocks could uh, go up and actually, as they have between 2011 and uh, December 2015, stocks could outperform precious metals. But my view is that because of the manipulation I referred to by central banks answering the first question, because of that, we all don't know how the world will look like in five years. I cannot envision any scenario, and I repeat, any scenario under which there will not be significant pain for investors. Something will give at some point, and it will be very painful for asset holders. Exactly when and how it will happen, I don't know. It could first, people could continue to make a lot of money in assets like real estate, stocks, bonds, and precious metals, and one day the music stops and then losses will occur. But under this scenario, I would say a responsible investor who really thinks it through needs to be diversified. He needs to have some real estate. He needs to have some equities and bonds and cash and obviously some precious metals. Each person is his own master, has to decide for himself how he wants to allocate it. I usually allocate roughly as a guideline 25% real estate, 25% equities, 25% precious metals, and 25% say bonds and cash. I think Eric Strott would disagree with me and he would have a much higher allocation to precious metals than I have. Equally, my friend who runs Nova Gold he would also have a much larger allocation to precious metals than I have. And so forth. So, you know, different people have different views. 
for me to have about a 25% allocation to precious metals is probably uh, much more than typical investors will have, you understand? Mm -hmm. So you already overweight with that. Say if you look at the S&P, what is the weight of precious metal shares in the S&P? It's very low. It's nowhere near 25%. So a fund manager, he will be reluctant to go to 25% because he's measured according to the uh, to a benchmark, which is say the S&P or the Russell uh, 2000 or the Dow Jones or whatever it is. But uh, I think that uh, the pension funds, the whole industry stinks. As you said, <laughs> they are grossly underfunded, but uh, they don't tell the public that they're so underfunded. And they think that they can maintain their returns. The return expectations are around 7%. I think this is fantasy land in a world where, say, U.S. Treasury bonds, the 10 years yields 1.78% tonight, the 30 years around 2.67% and so forth. So in that world, and zero interest rates, how are you going to make 7% per year in uh, returns? It's out of the question. And then they go, as you said, in risky assets like private equity and so forth, but private equity depends on a buoyant stock market. So that the companies, the private equity firms, they buy assets. And then to make money, they will have to sell them to the public. You know, uh, they go and sell them into the share market. And that only works when the stock market is hot. It hasn't worked in the first quarter of this year when uh, the markets performed poorly. So they couldn't sell. And so a lot of private equity firms will have actually have large losses. Equally, as you know, hedge funds haven't performed well. So I think these return expectations are a mirage. And uh, I would tell retirees, don't rely on your pensions. If they come, be pleasantly surprised and hope for the best. But I wouldn't rely entirely on it. Yep, I think that's. I think that most folks are starting to think of it that way. You're right. Just two more quick questions for you, Mark. Uh, one of them has to do with a gold standard. Uh, a lot of folks are talking about sound money and and returning to back to some type of sound money and a gold standard. But governments are already now so fiscally irresponsible. Why would a gold standard change their behavior? And then, as a follow up to that, uh, do you think or you even expect? Uh, a government around the world, maybe the Chinese or the Russians or or maybe a combination regionally, would uh, do you expect a return to some hard asset-backed currency as an alternative to the U.S. dollar? The issue here is really at the present time, and we have in the history of mankind, we had uh, monarchies and we had uh, oligarchies, <laughs> so we had all kinds of systems. At the present time, it seems that the world is ruled by a bunch of incompetent academics at central banks who can manipulate uh, the entire global monetary system and with it asset prices and currencies. I think this regime will fail. Again, as I said earlier, I don't know when it will fail. It could fail in a year's time, it could fail in five years' time, but it's likely to completely fail. And when it fails, uh, central bankers will have lost their prestige. People will be really fed up, uh, both the financial service industry and individual investors and actually responsible government officials if they are such around, that is a big question, <laughs> but if there are still some responsible people around, uh, they will probably get rid of the power of central banks. And then they will scratch their heads and say, well, how could central banks get into a position of so much power? That will be then the question that will be asked. 
Then they'll find all kinds of documents that show how the central banks essentially uh, manipulated markets and so forth. So they will say, well, the best is to introduce some discipline. And the gold standard was not a perfect system, but it was a system that maintained some discipline until one country uh, abandoned this discipline. And which country was it? Of course, the U.S. Because the U.S. has this American exceptionalism. For everybody, a rule applies except for the U.S. And so they broke away essentially from the gold standard. And since then, uh, we have uh, money printing, we have higher volatility in the e e economy, higher volatility in asset markets. And uh, I believe that we will go back to some kind of a discipline system and hard currency system. But again, when it comes about, I don't know. And I also believe that when it happens, things will have to be very bad before it can happen, because as long as the central banks in the Western world, and I include Japan to that, you know, those Western Europe, the U.S., Japan, as long as they can print, they'll do that. And probably the Chinese may also do it at some point. They also print money, but uh, they have a more vibrant economy than other people have, although it may also go into recession now. So I think the mess will be such that, uh, you know, governments may sit together and say, well, we have to curtail the, the power of these central banks. The problem I have with this view is that if things really get bad and before the whole system breaks down, certainly in the U.S., in Western Europe, they may introduce legislation and uh, they could introduce emergency legislation whereby they would say, you know why the economy is performing badly? It's because some people like Eric Strzok and Mark Faber hold physical gold, and the money doesn't flow back into the economy. <laughs> so the first thing that we need to do is to take the gold away from Eric Strzok and Mark Faber and company. This we is my concern. Let's hope it doesn't come to that, but I know that's on a lot of folks' minds, too. Uh, one last question for you, Mark, and it has to do with platinum, which historically is traded near the gold price, about the same, maybe within a couple of percentage points, but at present is down about 25% below the gold price. Uh, why is that? You trade at the premium. Mm, yes, it, 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 why, why is it now at a discount? Is that, can you address that, and is that an opportunity? Well, you ask me why. I should ask you. I don't know why. <laughs> but uh, I suppose that uh, it's a less liquid type of market than the gold market, and it's more volatile. But historically seen, when the discount to the gold price was this high, uh, platinum was a better buy than gold. So if someone is really keen to make capital gains, right now I think platinum and also silver are maybe more desirable than gold. I hold most of my precious metals in gold, but I have some platinum as well. Yes, and, and I, I think a lot of folks are interested to hear your views on silver, too. Yes, it hasn't quite kept up so far this year with gold, but do you like silver as well? Yes, I think, let's put it this way, technically, it looks uh, very attractive and you could have a big move. But I believe that uh, both platinum and uh, silver are more, in more perceived as industrial or depending on industrial demand than gold. Gold has not much, I mean, it has use in industry, but it's not perceived as being driven by industrial demand, whereas silver and platinum are to some extent driven by industrial demand. But I think that the investors, again, uh, because of what I said, that we don't know how the world will look like, 
that maybe they should also diversify out of gold and own some platinum and silver. It sounds like it's always a good strategy. Dr. Faber, thank you so much for spending some time with us. It's brought money well, news. My pleasure. Can you, can you just take one moment and tell everybody about uh, the Gloom, Boom, and Doom report and how they can subscribe? <laughs> well, I have uh, two reports. One is the Gloom, Boom, and Doom report, which is a printed edition of a monthly report. And then I have a website report, uh, the monthly report, and uh, people who are interested, they can go to www.gloomboomdoom.com. Thank you so much for your time. Well, Joining us now is Mark Faber, editor and publisher of the Gloom, Boom, and Doom Report website, www.gloomboomdoom.com. Mark, we've done this so many times over the years, but I always ask you to start off. What are you seeing on your travels? Well, basically, uh, about two years ago, I started to see, certainly in Asia, a massive slowdown in economic activity. And this was reflected a, by the peak in commodity prices in 2011, and then more pronouncedly last July, August, when commodity prices really started to tumble. But there were also other signs of a slowdown. Industrial production was slowing down. And in many countries, the exchange rate started to weaken, which is not a sign of positive economic growth. And then we had these failed monetary policies by Japan and the ECB, and also to a large extent driven by the Fed, where because of the easing policies of the Fed, the euro and the yen had become very strong. Then uh, the view was among the central planners who are academics at central banks, the view set in that the best would be to devalue the currency. But if you look at the world and you measure GDP in U.S. dollars, if foreign central banks weaken their currency, in dollar terms, world GDP declines and also global trade declines. And this is exactly what has happened. And uh, at the same time, we saw in China after 2008 a gigantic credit bubble developing and that obviously this credit bubble was not sustainable in the long run, that it would lead to a lot of misallocation of capital. And so the slowdown in the global economy was obvious already a long time ago. It wasn't acknowledged by the eternally bullish Wall Street fraternity. And private bankers around the world who told their clients everything is fine. But it was quite obvious. Mark, let me ask you this. What is the biggest danger in the financial system today as you see it? Well, basically, uh, there are many levels of danger. First of all, asset prices, whether it's for stock or bonds or real estate, art, collectibles, wines, and so forth, asset prices are very elevated. Uh, in my view, they are at a very high level, especially if you compare the asset prices today, say, to the 1970s, when, because of sharply rising interest rates, asset prices, stocks, bonds, real estate were inexpensive. Now, all the asset prices are very high. Now, the Fed and other central banks' view was that by printing money, asset prices would go up and that therefore there would be a trickle-down effect and boost economic activity. That was their view. Asset prices have gone up. In that sense, monetary policies have been successful to boost asset prices, but monetary policies have failed at boosting economic growth rates meaningfully. We had a very tepid recovery 
a lack of capital spending, and the recovery has been largely driven by superimposing a debt bubble on another debt bubble. We had a credit bubble that led to the housing collapse in 2007, and then we had another credit bubble that is very uh, pronounced, especially with regard uh, to government debt. And the government debt has a percent of the economy everywhere is up substantially. You talked about the debt briefly there in the West and the fact that we went from one debt bubble superimposing another one on top of that, Mark. But, you know, people have watched this unfold in Japan for a long time, and the interest rates have stayed low there, and it just seems to go on and on and, until it stops working. And how close is the West to that point, Japan, the West itself? Conditions, especially in the U.S., are quite different than in Japan. In Japan, you had not a large credit bubble and asset bubble, but by 1989, you had a huge stock market bubble and a huge real estate bubble. And then the asset bubble got deflated, but the standard of living of the average Japanese was not impaired because whereas before, he couldn't afford to join a golf club, he couldn't afford to buy a house or an apartment, and stocks were very expensive. Now, the prices of real estate and of uh, all consumer goods are more reasonable. But then came Abenomics, and by depressing the value of the yen, it makes Japanese in U.S. dollar terms poorer. And so they actually, as a result of these abenomic policies, they don't spend more. They rather spend less. So I would say, in general, the policies of central banks have been a, a complete failure, except for boosting asset prices. Now, the problem with asset prices is that they go up and they go down. And when asset prices decline, as they have in the last, say, nine months, since May 2015 in the U.S. on the S&P, in emerging markets for the last three years, and in Japan more recently, and then the decline in uh, stock prices uh, since the beginning of the year, even art prices in some cases are going down, some luxury markets, real estate like Hampton, New York, London, we also have some prices declining. It then has a negative impact on the economy. Now, the only way the central banks could actually counter this negative wealth impact on the economy would be to increase their money printing. In other words, the Fed would have to start QE4 and not implemented by, say, $85 billion a month, but, say, by $150 billion or $200 billion a month. And then we run into some problems. A, is it uh, politically feasible? Uh, maybe in election year not. And if the Republicans come in, maybe not. Or what they can also do is a mixture of monetary policies and fiscal policies, and that would be so-called helicopter money. You would send, say, each American family, either each one of them, or people that have a salary below a certain level, you would send them a check for, say, 10,000 U.S. dollars. And that would then boost economic activity temporarily in the short run, but actually probably less than is expected. So you understand this intervention into the free market by the so-called neo-Keynesians have had some unintended consequences that are negative. And just before you asked me what is the big effect for the global economy, I would argue that Following December 2008, when the Fed got interest rates to essentially zero, they stayed at zero essentially until December 2015, 
that is imprudent lending. In other words, the typical investor, he says to himself, if I put my money on deposit for treasury bills, I don't earn anything. So he went out on the yield curve, and treasuries have performed reasonably well, but he also went into junk bonds and into emerging market tech. And that led in emerging economy to a huge capital spending thing, especially in China. So as a percent of global GDP, capital spending in emerging economies increased from 4% in 2005, 5% in 2007 to 8% recently. Now this capital spending is coming down, which is causing essentially this global recession I was just referring to. Besides the money printing, which is a way to try to inflate out of this nightmare, should government theft be a big concern for investors going forward, Mark? Yes, I think investors should be concerned that a bunch of academics and professors have so much power, and they basically have very little responsibility. You understand? If you say, say, George Soros or Paul Tudor Jones or whoever it is in the hedge fund industry, you have your own money in the game. In other words, if you make bad decisions, you lose money as well. The central bank, basically, all the employees, their decisions can be hopelessly wrong and they get hired by companies like Goldman Sachs and take huge salaries. So they have nothing to lose. And for them, the whole exercise is about power and it's about uh, trying new gimmicks as they move along, like they are now more than eight trillion dollars worth of sovereign bonds with negative interest rates. Negative interest rates. It's a very interesting legal case because in most constitutions it is written that expropriation is not an option. But negative interest rates are essentially an expropriation of favored money. Mark, obviously we've had this big rally in the gold market off the lows and seems to have tremendous strength underneath it. Your thoughts on what's going to happen here with gold? Well, as you know, I always advocated that people own some gold, physical gold. And uh, I always argued that a free market is a market where no market participant has an influence on the price. But nowadays, what actually is uh, prohibited and the criminal act in most countries, namely manipulation of markets, this is precisely being pursued by central banks. They manipulate currencies, they manipulate interest rates. And in this environment, you just don't know how far the mad professors will go. Looking forward, we all don't know how the world will look like in five years' time, ten years' time. I would hold some real estate. I would hold some stocks. I would hold some bonds and cash and some precious metals. I happen to believe that the precious metals have probably bottomed out, so I cannot send you a guarantee for that. I don't know for sure. The mining stocks by historical standards, <laughs> compared to the price of gold and compared to the S&P 500, are incredibly depressed, even after most of them have almost doubled in price from the lows. The lows were in September, October of last year. Mark, you bring up gold there, and exclusively for King World News listeners around the world who want to set up a gold account for yourself or a loved one, there is a 5% deposit bonus right now with BitGold, up to $100, meaning you can put $2,000 into an account and instantly be credited with $2,100 of gold. To take advantage of that special offer, just email alexander at bitgold.com. That's A-L-E-X-A-N-D-E-R at bitgold.com. BitGold is revolutionizing the world, and you can become part of that revolution by opening your account today at bitgold.com. What do you expect 
Marker, what would be some predictions for the rest of 2016? Any surprises out there? Well, I believe the stock markets around the world will end the year lower, but it will depend on how much money the central bankers will print. As I said, you don't know how far these mad professors will go. They can launch a QE4 with $500 billion a month, and in theory, in theory, they could buy the whole stock market. Well, some central banks, Today we are pleased to have Mr. Mark Faber as our guest. Mr. Faber has agreed to be our guest today to discuss the stability. I hopefully we will discuss the stability of the world's financial situation. Hopefully it's a lot more stable than the problems that we've had this morning with our board operation. But Mr. Faber is a Swiss investor based in Thailand and publisher of the Gloom, Boom, and Doom Report and is the director of Mark Faber Limited, which acts as an investment advisor and fund manager. Uh, he can be reached on uh, through his website, uh, gloomboomanddoom.com. Uh, his worldview and scope of knowledge is second to none, and he'll be asked today about the risk of global collapse in the bond market. If you wish, you may call him with your questions or comments, 646-652-4620. Make sure you press the one button so we know that you want to interview, inter interfere with the program and ask your question. Mr. Faber, thank you so much for being on our show today. It's my pleasure. Thank you. Well, you know, I, I have to admit that uh, I'm, uh, uh, I'm a real fan of yours. Uh, I, I probably listen to you, you about once a week, you know, in, on, online, and I truly enjoy your insights. Um, not long ago, I had uh, uh, Michael Pinto on, and of course, he's, he's big in the bond market, and he's written a book about the uh, bond, uh, on upcoming bond collapse, which he wrote back in 2003, and also Gerald Salente, he's not too happy about what's going on as well. And I was wondering what your take was. It seems that the world is, 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 is enveloped in debt. And, and the way we're going to get out of the malaise, the international malaise that we are in financially, is creating more debt, lower interest rates, and uh, printing more money. Now, uh, I, I'm not the smartest guy in the world. I'll, I'll be the first to admit it. But it sure seems like this is lunatics running the asylum. Am I way off base, or should I just find another profession at this point? <laughs> No, I've maintained that for a long time, that you cannot trust the monetary system to a bunch of academics, most of whom never worked in their lives except in academia and at government agencies such as the Federal Reserve and uh, other central banks in the world. And there's no question that it will end badly this unprecedented uh, monetary experiment. Here we have uh, recorded human history of something like five, 6,000 years, and interest rates have never been this low. We never had negative interest rates, and it is clear one day the bond market will react negatively. But it's not so crystal clear uh, how it will manifest itself. Because in theory, if you think about it in Japan, the Bank of Japan is essentially buying all the debts that are being issued by the Japanese Treasury. So that keeps rates very low. The question is, what will first happen? A collapse in the currency? And if there is a collapse in the currency, against what will the currency collapse? You, know, right. you could argue, some will argue, well, the yen will collapse against the US dollar, or the euro will collapse against the US dollar. And others will say, well, the US dollar will collapse against the yen and against the euro. We don't know for sure. But my sense is that uh, currencies will continue to lose their purchasing power and if you recall, I mean, you're not that young anymore. So you also <laughs> lived through the 70s yes. and the early 80s when people were all concerned about accelerating inflation. And now the slogan is always deflation. 
But actually, in fact, if you look at home prices in the US, if you look at stock prices, if you look at art prices, at vintage cars, if you look at your insurance premiums, <laughs> if you look right. at uh, the educational costs for your children and taxes and contributions to the government, everything has become massively more expensive. So I don't see any evidence of serious deflation where the price level, like in the depression years, dropped 30 percent. That hasn't happened. Some prices have gone down. So say someone will say, well, the price of a PC or a notebook or a mobile phone has gone down. But that is, again, depends on what model you buy. The models of computer I use, actually their prices have gone up. Now someone will come and say that the functionality of the computer you have is much better than today than it was five years ago. That's correct. But I also need a much better computer now to function in business than I needed at that time. Right. It's like 15 or 20 years ago, I didn't need the internet. We had faxes and telex machines and so forth. So it changes everything. <laughs> but in general, I would say the cost of living of people has gone up a lot. And that's why you see a relatively poor economy. Uh, most people have not benefited from the asset bubble because they have no money. <laughs> it's right. as simple as that. Yeah. And of course it will end badly. Uh, socialism does not bring poverty. It is poverty that brings socialism. When people are disenchanted, when people are uh, unhappy about the system and uh, Trump, Donald Trump and Bernie Sanders are symptoms of a very unhappy population. Otherwise, they wouldn't have gone this far. Right. There is a, com but this is not only in the US, in democracies in general, there is a complete disconnect between the will of the people, between the people and the government officials. And uh, I think if most people understood what the Fed is doing, they would be against it. As it happened, as it happens, most people don't understand what the Fed is all about. They're more interested in Facebook pictures. Right. Not only they look at <laughs> nobody else, but basically uh, it is a transvesty, travesty, the way central bankers are behaving and destroying the value of money. Yeah. And you have to also see there is credit growth that is useful. You talked earlier on about the debt bubble in the world. There is credit that is useful. Say you and I, we build a factory, we borrow money uh, to build the factory, to buy the land, to acquire the machinery, to employ the employees and to acquire inventories and we start producing. Out of the production, we can then cover the interest payments and repay the debt. But our debt grows in the last 20, 30 years in the world has been debts that are unproductive, namely government debt, transfer payments. In other words, you take money out of your pocket and you give it to somebody else's pocket. Has no economic value at all. And so I think you're right, it will end very badly. But if you ask me exactly how badly and when it will end badly, I don't know. My sense is that one way to protect yourself is through diversification. You can't, it's dangerous to have all your money in cash in a bank. That has to be understood in an environment where central banks are destroying the value of money, it's dangerous to have only cash. So I would have some real estate with low leverage and I would uh, have uh, maybe some equities. I have equities and I would have uh, some precious metals. You know, and I would essentially avoid government bonds that have a negative yield. 
You understand? Nowadays in the world, you have eight trillion dollar worth of bonds with a negative yield. Right. In other words, you're guaranteed to lose money. Maybe not that much, but you're guaranteed to lose some money. Right. Well, you, you and know, since what I... I'm such a great optimist. <laughs> I think I can make some money. <laughs> well, I, I guess, you know, I, I, I just keep on going back to, you know, my earlier years. And um, I'm, I'm, I'm still very young. I'm only 73, but I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make it somehow. Yeah, okay. And um, but, you know, my times were so different when I was building a businesses and I've done a few of those. And, and, and my is that, you know, you saved money, you invested it. You purchased uh, items that were producible, that produced income. You stayed out of debt. I mean, basically, everything that I've learned, everything that I have done to become to, to to be where I am today. I own this whole studio, and I do it for fun. I mean, can you imagine someone saying, "Oh yeah, I'm going to open up a studio just for fun," but this is what I do. This is one of the things that I do. It's that some people, That's great. you know. America has to be grateful to people like you. Thank you so much. I appreciate Good. those words from you, especially. But yes. what bothers me is that the whole world seems to be contrary to the way I have built businesses and the way I have grown up. And what really surprises me is that the bastion of, of solid currency, your home homeland of Switzerland, isn't that not right? You're from uh, you're you're from, yes. you're from Switzerland. Yes. Has the highest negative interest rates in Europe, I believe. And you would think yes, if there would be one high. country standing up and I saying, know. "No, this is wrong," it's it would be the Swiss, and they didn't do that. Is it is it a worldwide conspiracy? They all can't be on the same page for the same at the same time doing the same idiotic thing. But what's your well, take on that? I want to tell you, some people have talked about currency wars. There is no currency war, except uh, there is coordination among central banks. They talk to each other daily, every day. The Bank of England, the Federal Reserve, the ECB, the Bank of Japan, right. they coordinate the monetary policy. So for a while, say the Fed eases, QE1, QE2, then uh, Operation Twist, QE3. Then they say to the Japanese, well, you know, you better do something as well because your yen is too strong. Yep. So you have to bring the value down of the yen. So then they embark and then the ECB embarks. And the problem for small countries like Switzerland is then if they don't play the game, their currency appreciates very substantially. Now, don't misunderstand me. I personally, as an economist, I don't think that the strong currency is damaging your industry. Right. I That's agree. all BS, essentially broadcasted by entrepreneurs and industry. They always say, oh, the, the currency is too strong. We can't compete. Uh, the countries with the strongest currencies over longer periods of time, like Germany, Japan, Switzerland, that are the strongest exporting countries. Right. And countries that have weak currencies over a longer period of time, like Latin America, they have very weak industry. They have resources, but their industries are relatively weak. Strong currencies forces the entrepreneurs to become more and more productive. So, but in Switzerland, the view was then among politicians and so forth that they can't compete if the currency is strong. So they have to take measures to lower the value of their currency, which to some extent they managed to do, but it has no positive impact on Switzerland. You understand? It's like in Japan, a weak yen hasn't been positive at all for the economy. In fact, it's been negative, say, you're a Japanese, you have your assets in yen. So two years ago, your assets in yen could be exchanged into US dollars at a 30% higher value. If you look at Japan, you measure the GDP in yen. In dollar terms, GDP is down 30% now in dollar terms. Right. So you understand, these devaluations uh, are 
is, are far from certain to be beneficial at all. But my sense is that all currencies will eventually continue to weaken and they'll probably weaken against uh, monetary assets like gold, silver and uh, platinum. Well, you know, I, I, I took some basic economic courses when I went to college and I, I went to a very good college, it was Pace College at the time in downtown New York, is in Wall Street area. And it was a, a, a very popular college for people who wanted to go into marketing or finance. And uh, I don't recall one page of economics history, economic theory that talked about the benefits of negative interest rates. Where did these clowns get this idea from? <laughs> yes, you said it. They're clowns. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> well, well, I, I want to tell you, the idea is basically that if you have excessive debts, you want to reduce the burden on the people that have the debts. But there are many unintended consequences for the system, say, let's say in America or throughout the world, a lot of people have savings. Say, you could be in retirement, so you would have savings, you would have some income from the interest on your savings, and you would have your pension and you would have social security or whatnot. Now, the people that have savings, they don't get anything. Right. In some countries, they're penalized. And number two, you see, the Fed and other central banks, they uh, brainwashed the world in kind of telling them deflation is bad and inflation is good. Right. This is utter economic nonsense because, say, in the 19th century in the U.S., we had 100 years, basically, of price stability with intermediate periods of deflation. Right. But what happened is that real wages went up. In other words, wages were stable or rising, and the cost of transportation, the cost of living went down. And so people became richer. In other words, GDP per capita in real terms in the 19th century increased at the faster pace than after the Federal Reserve was formed. So it was not uh, a system where deflation was negative. Deflation has some negative aspects when you are over leveraged. But this is not the problem of deflation. It's the problem that the central bankers, the clowns, <laughs> you call them so <laughs> appropriately, they were sleeping on the wheel during the huge debt bubble they created at the end of the 1990s and then until 2007. And now they're creating an even greater debt bubble, but this time is largely government debt. That is the least productive debt. Yeah. Well, we've we've been through now uh, this is the third major bubble in 15 years or so. Yes. You know, we we've, we've we've had the the, the dot com bubble, the tech bu bubble. Um we we've, yes. we've had the housing bubble and and now we have a debt bubble or a, a bond bubble and this this one trumps the other two significantly. Now, uh we didn't solve the problem. In other words, the patient was dying back in 1998. Um, remember, long-term capital management, that blew up. Jim Rickards, who was the uh, uh, lead counsel at the time, um, you know, had to negotiate with Greenspan et al. in order to save the entire world from collapsing. Well, that is minuscule compared to what is occurring today. Uh, I just yes, wonder what these people are thinking of. They know it's not going to last. And what are they doing to prepare for the big one? Yes, they don't do anything. They they just think uh, one of the central bankers said the other day, we are magic people. 
<laughs> you understand? Yeah. It's not only that they're incompetent, but they're also arrogant. That is the problem. Number two, I mean, you raised the issue of LTCM, long-term capital. For the system, it would have been best if they had failed. Right. Because that was a time when it's not yet too big to fail. And then again, in the Nasdaq bubble, it would have been better to let it deflate further and let the system be cleaned out instead of, as the neo-Keynesian all wanted, to create another bubble. But you understand, you're dealing with the fund management industry and Wall Street. They love bubbles. Right. Because their fees are paid on net asset value. The worst for them is that actually asset prices decline then they get less fees. So they encourage, actually, it's kind of a symbiotic relationship between the Goldman Sachs of this world. I'm not singling out Goldman Sachs, although maybe one should, and the central banks. The central banks, they will coordinate with the Wall Street people and so forth what to do. And when a central banker retires, he gets an advisory job with one of the Wall Street firms that pays a few million dollars a year. It's not my problem. I'm happy for them. I'm just saying it's basically a mafia that is not run by professional gangsters, but by clowns. <laughs> <as you say. laughs> okay. <laughs> Thank you. Yes. <laughs> well, you know, I, I, I usually give people the, you know, who are not in tune with the economics or the financial condition. You know, the average Joe Blow who needs things simplified, I say, well, just consider 1998, the patient got very sick and the doctors knew what type of medicine would be necessary in order to yes. save the patient, uh -huh. but they decided that would be too much work. They just gave him a lot of morphine and he felt really good. So he popped out of bed and he's running around with all this morphine <laughs> and then the morphine wore yeah. off and then he got really very, very sick and hardly walked, but they pumped him up with a whole bunch of morphine again. He got up and he was able to at least walk around with a cane, but he can walk around and he felt pretty good about it. Well, now the patient is sick again and the morphine ain't going to work. So how well, do you see, it's, what do you see is going to, how it's, this thing is going to unravel? I see nothing but, I mean, I hate to be oh, melodramatic, but it seems like almost Armaged financial Armageddon is, is, is before us and we're facing it in the... In yeah, yeah, like that. I basically agree with you, but you understand, if you print money, in theory, you can boost the Dow Jones to 100,000 within two years. Right. You just have to print enough. Right and you can boost the Japanese market, you just print enough. Uh, where I have some hesitation to believe that entirely is I see some signs of inflation uh, rising. You understand? At some point, the money printing may not go into stocks and into bonds and into uh, art, where it may go into rising consumer prices. And then what happens, and this has, a, because I studied the process of high inflation countries or inflation in high, in countries with high inflation. What happens is that and this has happened in the US and in Europe, real wages go down. In other words, right. the cost of living of people is going up more than their wages. So the standards of living is declining. And, but when that happens, what usually then occurs is that the economy worsens significantly. Then the clowns at the central banks will say, well, and they will be supported by the likes of Krugman. Well, we need more. We didn't do enough. Right. Then they'll throw again money at the system. QE4, QE5, QE6. And that can go on for quite some time. You understand? The central 
bank can keep on buying the bonds that the Treasury is issuing. I don't know how it will end, but I suppose that in this situation, people and investors will lose confidence in the system and they will want to own precious metals or some properties. Now, some properties are too expensive, but some properties around the world in the countryside are not that expensive. You live in Tulsa. Well, maybe in prime location, it's expensive. It's like Phoenix. Uh, but in other locations, maybe not that expensive. That's correct. That's correct. Well, it, 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 you know, people want to blame all of the people who have money. And of course, they, they, they categorize everyone into one, one group. Uh, of course, there are those people within the system that are cheating the system, that are uh, connected with government, with industry, that have um, some sort of allegiance to uh, individuals that they support for government, uh, for, for office, and as a result, they get kickbacks, and all that funny money and all that dirty stuff that goes on. But for the most part, there are people who adhere to basic uh, uh, valid economic principles like you know you produce you invest you save you know in this cycle which are very few i i believe and and tell me if i'm wrong those people people who are adhering to the old paradigm of hard work honest living saving you know and and doing the right thing basically economically and personally these people are going to do extremely well because they're always prepared for catastrophe because that's the way they live. They always make sure that there's money on the side, that the money is allocated in a certain way, and that their business are productive and out of debt. Now, but these people are not the mega rich. These are the, just the, the, those people who are doing well because they adhere to uh, principles of economics that are valid. Do you agree with that? Yes, of course, I mean, uh, as is uh, the case for you, you see, my parents, they had uh, lived through World War II, right. and my grandparents, they had lived through World War I, and the Depression years, and in Germany, the hyperinflation years, they had one disaster after another right. in the 20th century. So after World War II, they were, of course, financially extremely conservative. Right. In my family, nobody ever borrowed any money. <laughs> when they saved, when they had enough savings, they bought the car or whatever it is. They would never have dreamt to buy anything on installment credit, nor would I. But this has changed this mentality and also the whole entitlement mentality. Each time something happens, oh, the government should help me. Well, you want freedom, you have to accept personal responsibility. If you're not prepared to have your personal responsibility, then you should go and live in a socialist country. Yeah, like the United you know, that States. That is now creeping in. <laughs> it's creeping in in Europe and in the U.S., yeah, but aren't we a socialist country now? I mean, for all intent and purposes, uh, the m money is absconded from the productive and then <laughs> divvied out to uh, political well, uh, political favors. And for those people who are producing nothing, <laughs> government, although is maybe. not growing anymore, but people who work for the government are, in fact, not producing anything and shouldn't even be included in the um, employment certificates. Certifi uh, certi yeah, statistics. I agree with you. I don't think that government spending should be included in uh, GDP. Right. It should be deducted. But, uh, you understand? I also believe we don't have a socialist system the way we had it in the Soviet Union and in China and Vietnam and in Eastern Europe uh, following the Second World War or in Russia since 1918. But we have maybe a worse combination. We have crony capitalism, as right. you just hinted before. Uh, unless a large businessman becomes kind of uh, in, entangled with the government, he is in, at the disadvantage. He's almost forced to have lobbies for him and to do things for him. Otherwise, legislation maybe 
unfavorable for him. So we have crony capitalism on the one hand, and I have to say this, uh, your listeners should pay attention to the Federal Reserve and other central banks, they have financed the expansion of government becoming bigger and bigger. Correct. And the debt grows and the deficits. And then you have more and more regulation and more and more harassment of the small businessman. And the larger the government is, you've seen all these studies, productivity is not rising much. Is the productivity improvements are very disappointing. This has to do, the bigger the government, the less productivity growth there is. Right, yeah. You know, it's, it's, it's I've, I've, I've said this, gave the story out, uh, relay the story on my show so many times, I'm sure uh, if people hear it one more time, they're gonna start hanging up. But, you know, my, my father came here from the old country uh, with not a dime in his pocket and he complained all of his life that the biggest mistake he ever made was borrowing fourteen dollars from his future mother-in-law, because she <laughs> really she Especially never the mother-in-law. <laughs> <laughs> she she never made him forget it. And do you know that on his deathbed he was still complaining about that? <laughs> <laughs> I'm not kidding. He said, the biggest mistake I ever made. I said, Bob, please take care of yourself. Please be relaxed, you know, for a while. You know, he still complained about that. And I, I'm reminded of that several times daily when I meet people and I see the, when I watch television and I see the way people handle money, handle themselves, their lifestyle. I think either I'm the lunatic or the whole world has gone crazy, but I don't yes, identify with you, it at you all. Understand? I will give you a, an argument that someone raised the other day with me. He said, well, you know, zero or negative interest rates are very good because they stimulate huge innovation. Now, the Nasdaq bubble was a deliberate creation of Mr. Alan Greenspan. I know this from a former Fed voting a member. He, Greenspan thought that by creating a Nasdaq bubble, it would fuel innovation and so forth, which to some extent is true. But you understand when you take economic policy measures, you have to look at all aspects. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, each policy measure may have some beneficial impact, some but huge negative impacts. Most American families, the median American wealth in America is lower than it was in the year 2000 because bubbles enrich a few, the Wall Street, and impoverishes the majority, already observed by the famous American economist Irving Fisher. It impoverishes the majority. Right. How many families have went to Atlanta after the housing bubble. It's actually tragic to see all these homes where people were evicted. They had children. The children went to local schools. And these families were kicked out of the homes. Do you think it's fun? Do you think it's a nice thing to do? This, I make the Federal Reserve responsible. And by the way, who was responsible for the greatest housing bubbles? California, Nevada. That's right. <laughs> and yep. um, and I think also... The Florida was big in, in that. Yeah, but Yellen was in charge of the Fed in San Francisco, president. Oh, I see. Yes. And Nevada, the three biggest housing bubbles were, yes, uh, California, Arizona, and Nevada. Mm -hmm. She was in charge of those districts. Ah. She's the money printer par excellence. Ah, I see. Right. Well, uh, we're 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 She's running the number one clown. <laughs> number one clown. Okay. <laughs> All right. We're we're running close to the end of our show. Yes. But I, before you. we before we sign off, I I'd, I'd like for you to look into your crystal ball, just polish it off if you can, yes. and tell us what do you how do you see things unwinding? Obviously, it cannot go on forever. There's 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 Mother Nature always has a way of coming back and saying, okay, guys, you had your fun. 
um, now we're going to correct everything, and uh, those people you know, who were playing the game are now going to suffer a little bit because you had too much fun. Mother Nature has a way of always neutralizing everything. Yes. What, is, what is your take? How do you see this whole thing unraveling? Well, I think uh, when things will go bad, they'll print more money. And when that doesn't help, there may be social unrest or what nations frequently have done is uh, they started to take money away from the rich. You know, we talked about this uh, wealthy people before. I would say a lot of wealthy people, they haven't done anything terribly wrong. It's the Federal Reserve that made them rich. You understand? Because right. the Federal Reserve with their easy monetary policies boosted asset prices. If you have no assets, you don't benefit. But if you already have money, homes and stocks and bonds, you benefited enormously. And I believe these people, uh, including to some extent you and me who have assets, you said you have your studio, we will uh, lose money. Some will be taken away from us, wealth right. taxes or higher taxes on incomes or on capital gains, or they can introduce a wealth tax and say we take 20% of all the wealth from the rich people away. It's not going to help, but to satisfy the unrest among the people, it will be a measure that populist governments will do. Number three, I think there is the possibility and uh, it's very clear that we have a rise in international tensions very clearly. Uh, partly because the US is unreasonable about uh, the rise of China. It's clear that the Chinese want to have some security in the South and East China Sea, which the US has a different view about and so forth. The U.S. and NATO also harassed Putin. I'm not saying that Putin is a nice guy, but you understand? For Russia, the Crimea is of paramount strategic importance. Right. It has zero value for the U.S., zero value for NATO. But for Russia, it has value. So they miscalculated there. They miscalculated about the whole eastern Ukraine, which is east of the Dnieper. And so the tensions are actually quite high. In the Middle East, we have essentially a complete mess. Right. Complete mess. Yeah. <clears throat> and how this all will end, I don't know. But I would hold some precious metals physically in physical form. Okay. Well, you know, when I was uh, when I was growing up in Harlem, New York, you know, you, you, the warlords were always guys you wanted to stay on the right side of, you know. <laughs> you, you didn't want to be on the wrong side of somebody who was the head of the gangs in New York and stuff like that. Yeah, yeah sure. And, and so, to, to me, uh, I always think, you know, if... if uh, and probably, to a lesser extent, in the case of platinum, there is huge inventories of gold, uh, in the hands of investors. So let's say we have in the world, I don't know, 150,000 tons of gold, of existing uh, gold supplies, of existing gold, and the supply is, uh, I think, 2,000 tons a year or something like this. And so whether the, the, the supply is large or small, in comparison to the existing gold holdings, it's not meaningful. So the demand supply equation in the case of silver and gold, I suppose in a very long run, it has an impact, but not on a yearly basis. What impacts the gold price and the silver price, platinum, to some extent also palladium, is what investors want to do. Are they accumulating or are they selling? Plus, some of these metals may be manipulated. Who knows? Let me lead you then from there to the uh, folks that dig the stuff out of the ground. There has been a significant rally over the last 90 days in the, in the mining shares. 
So we received several thoughts uh, or questions wondering about your thoughts on that sector going forward. Well, as you know, the mining sector has been a disaster compared to the S&P since 2011. And starting uh, the fourth quarter of last year, the shares began to bottom out and started to appreciate not just against the S&P, but also on their own. In other words, say you look at the various gold ETFs, uh, they're up between 50 and 60 and close to 70% from the lows. So they have begun to outperform the S&P. I think they are overbought in the near term. But when I look at the whole investment community in the world, and I travel extensively to Japan and to Europe and the Middle East and everywhere, uh, hardly anybody really owns gold and precious metal share. So my sense is that once the investment community that is by and large not very smart, <laughs> the mm -hmm. professional money managers. But once these professional money managers understand that the money printing is likely to continue, I don't see it uh, stopping. I don't believe there is a currency war. I believe the central banks coordinate their monetary policies. And we know that Yellen talks regularly to Draghi and so forth. And in this environment, I think eventually even uh, the fund managers <laughs> will realize that it may be a good idea to keep maybe 5 to 10% of their assets in precious metals. And by then, obviously, precious metals will be on fire as well as the shares of the underlying companies that produce precious metals. My sense is that we've seen a low in precious metals prices. We had a very powerful rally. Uh, very few people actually believe in the rally. Uh, there is probably a correction uh, occurring now or about to happen. And then we'll go, in my view, significantly higher. Sounds good to me. And I think most of, most folks listening would take you up on that. Yes, I think most people at Sprott, they would love to see significantly higher uh, come out, uh, precious metals prices. Yes. I'm not saying this because I'm a board member of Sprott. I'm saying this because, for me, the difficulty is to understand that in this money printing environment, precious metals are not yet significantly higher. This is something I don't quite understand. Because let's say, if you look at all the wealth in Dr. Faber, thank you very much for spending some time with us today. It's my pleasure. Thank you. Tell you what, let's just dive right into the questions. We've been collecting questions from Sprott Money customers for the last couple of weeks, and they've got a nice wide range for you. Uh, let's start right in your wheelhouse, I suppose. It has to do with central bank monetary policy. You know, we've been uh, the central banks have been able to manipulate asset prices higher since 2009 through quantitative easing and interest rates. Uh, what's going to stop them from keeping this process going almost indefinitely? Well, this is a very good question because uh, if they were able to increase their balance sheets by 20 times since 1998 up to now, uh, who is to say that they won't increase it another 20 times? So, in principle, uh, a central bank can print money and they can uh, control the flow of credit to some extent, not 100%, but to some extent. And so in principle, they could keep on buying assets. They can buy the whole government bond market. Uh, they can buy mortgage-backed securities. And I suppose uh, that they also intervene in equities as some foreign central banks have already done. Uh, whether the Fed does it on a regular basis or occasionally, who knows. 
but I wouldn't be surprised if they also manipulated equity prices. And so we don't know how far they will go. As you know, in some countries, the central banks have instituted negative interest rates, which are an anomaly uh, historically seen, say, in the 5,000 years of recorded human history. We never had negative interest rates. So this is a, a novelty. It's basically a hidden expropriation uh, that is, in my view, very unfair. And to hold cash under these conditions of money printing is actually very dangerous. Can you expand on that, the, the dangerous quality of owning cash? Well, there certainly well, are. Well, basically, cash, you have no interest on cash and uh, it depreciates against uh, assets, not all assets, because uh, when you print money, not everything goes up at the same rate. So maybe for a few years you have a housing boom, and then for a few years you have a stock market boom, and for a few years you have mm -hmm. fresh metals boom, and for a few years people stuck, stuck their money in art and in collectibles, in Ferraris, and so forth and so on. You never know exactly where the money will flow. But uh, to hold cash in this environment, uh, historically seen, has been dangerous. Uh, we received several questions regarding the supply and demand of physical precious metal. Uh, one has to do with gold. There are a lot of anecdotal stories out there. Uh, about gold and uh, mining com or I'm sorry, refiners that are running 24/7 shifts trying to keep up with demand. Uh, several readers just wanted to know if you had any stories or any details that you could provide in that regard. I understand the investors' concern with demand and supply, but I'd just like to make one point very clear. In the case of wheat, corn, soybeans, coffee, cocoa. Demand and supply is very important because essentially these are perishable commodities and every year the supply is essentially taken up. And so whether the demand is strong and usually these commodities they fluctuate according to supplies, if there is a bad crop, uh, then prices tend to go up because the demand is relatively steady but rising in the long run. In the case of gold, silver, and in my view it will not help the economy much, but the central banks are basically so deep into trouble that they will continue with their policies of printing money. And uh, in the U.S., uh, the Fed, as you know, they slashed the Fed fund rate to next to zero in December 2008. And they had many opportunities to increase interest rates when the economy was actually expanding 2010, 2011. But they didn't. But precisely as the global economy was weakening, in December 2015, they increased the Fed fund rate marginally, not significantly. But from what I hear them saying at the present time, it is most unlikely, and I repeat, most unlikely that they will continue to increase interest rate. And so the question, to answer the question is we don't know. Uh, the future is unknown to us, but it is especially unknown to us if there are massive market manipulations. But they can go very far, and we had countries where they printed money, where stocks kept on going up and up and up, but the currency is weakened. Now, in the case of today's world, we have essentially a few major currencies, the U.S. dollar, the euro, the yen, uh, the pound sterling, and the yuan. And if they all print money at the same time, or uh, for six months this bank prints money, and then for the next six months that central bank prints money as well, 
uh, the currencies may all depreciate, in which case I suppose that these currency depreciations will occur against assets, including obviously precious metal. I'm always telling people if you have this kind of policy in place, and many individuals, they have most of their money in cash, uh, 